In this segment, we're going to be looking at groundwater. There's lots of water on the Earth. If you look at the Earth from space, it's like mostly water, except most of Earth's water is trapped in those oceans. And because they're salty, they don't provide a useful source of drinking water for humans and any animals that uh, survive off of it. If you look at just the fresh water on Earth, most of that is trapped in glaciers. Only a very, very small percentage of water on Earth is easily accessible and usable. And you can see in this graph here that our biggest storage that's easily accessible is groundwater. Groundwater is simply water that's stored underground. Although this tends to be kind of confusing for people. We have this image of an underground tank of water sloshing around, but that's not how it works at all. So I'm going to give you an example to help you kind of understand this. So I want you to imagine a Sonic cup. That's my favorite place to get sodas from, mainly because it's got that pebbly kind of ice. I love the ice in the Sonic cups. Um, so I want you to think about this Sonic cup, all right? And we're going to get rid of sort of extraneous information. So when you go into or you pull up to a Sonic and you order a drink, the first thing they're going to put in is the ice. Now, what I want you to, we're going to do a little thought experiment. Let's say you order a drink and they're like, hey, we're running a special and we know it's really hot in Arizona and our ice melts pretty fast. So we're going to give you an option. You can either go with the traditional Sonic pellet shaped ice or you can get one big block of ice that's going to melt a whole lot slower and keep your drink even colder. So out of these two choices, which one do you think you would prefer? All right, hopefully you're going to go with the uh, traditional ice because obviously if you have just one big block of ice, it's going to take up all the room in your cup and you're not going to have room for Dr. Pepper. And that's really the important part here, right? All right, so we know that this pellet ice works the best for storing Dr. Pepper. And actually, this works pretty well for groundwater. So when you think of this ice, I want you to think of sand and gravel. Solid rock works more like that one big ice cube. So ice is sort of like sand and gravel that's stored underground. All right, now, once you've got your ice in there, what did they put in next? They put in your Dr. Pepper. Except the Dr. Pepper doesn't just sit on the top of all the ice. And the Dr. Pepper doesn't go to the very bottom of the cup and move all the ice out of the way. The Dr. Pepper is going to be into nooks and crevices in between those ice cubes. And that's how it works in groundwater too. So the Dr. Pepper is like the water that's stored between the grains of sand and gravel underground. So this, this is where your groundwater is. Um, now the last thing is they put in a straw, or you put your own straw in, right, to be able to drink. And the level of Dr. Pepper in your straw is exactly the same as the level of the Dr. Pepper in your cup, right? And this, uh, your straw acts as a water well. So that's how you take Dr. Pepper out of the cup. And a well is how we take water out of the groundwater system. Now this level of Dr. Pepper in your cup and the straw, since they're the exact same, in groundwater, this is called the water table. Now does the height of the Dr. Pepper in your cup ever change? Well, of course it does, because as you drink water, as you take, or as you drink the Dr. Pepper, you take Dr. Pepper out of the cup, the water level drops. Now if you uh, are lucky enough to be able to talk one of the car hops into refilling your drink, which doesn't really happen, but play along with me, um, if you refill it, the water level goes back up, and so does in the cup and in the straw. So this is going to happen in our natural groundwater system too. So if we look at a groundwater system, this sort of works pretty much exactly the same as the cup, right? So at the top, you have this zone of aeration. That's the ice at the top of your cup. Um, this is also known as the Veda zone or the unsaturated zone all works the same. So in this area, there's Dr. Pepper in your cup, but most of it's trickling down to the bottom, right? So this is an area where there's some water, but most of that water is on the move. 
at the bottom here is what's called the zone of saturation or phreatic zone. This is where your groundwater is, and this is where you have to drill down to hit in order to extract groundwater. And so this is where that Dr. Pepper was at the bottom of your cup. And the line between the two is the water table. So the water table is the upper limit of the zone of saturation. And it changes over time due to natural processes like rain falling or bodies of water that allow water to seep into the groundwater system and that's going to raise it. Um, it can also be affected by human caused issues like wells where you have extraction of water or even dry wells where water is actually put back into the system and that can that can cause the water table to change too. And what's happening in this water table is actually pretty important um, to determine the health of our groundwater system. So recharge is what occurs when the water when water enters the groundwater system and this happens through infiltration and it makes the groundwater table rise and discharge is what occurs when water leaves the groundwater system and this happens through either wells or natural springs and this can make the water table drop. Now water is always on the move and groundwater is no different. Groundwater always flows down the hydraulic head or the hydraulic gradient. Um, basically, it may, the hydraulic gradient is the slope of the water table. So this means groundwater is going to flow from points where the water table is really high, like in point H1, to where the water table is lower, like H2. So it's always moving from H1 to H2 in this case, and even further down. Um, what you should notice, though, is the water table is almost always underground because it's groundwater. There are locations where the water table is above the surface. In this case, you can see there's rivers or this pond. So when you see s surface water, at least in a lot of places, that's a really good indication of where the water table is, particularly for natural lakes. Now in Arizona, this is a little weird because our rivers are our main source uh, or our main surface water and they're actually far above the water table and actually the water in the rivers are soaking down underground so they're called losing streams so we're actually losing water on our rivers not just because of agricultural use um, but we're going to look at this pond so lakes are a really good indication of where your water table is so if we look at somewhere like Florida. All right, so here's a look at Florida. What I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in to this central Florida here. Um, this is sort of centered around the town of Winter Haven. You can tell that this is a place where a lot of uh, folks from up north come down to retire, at least to spend their winter, because there's a Winter Haven. There's a frost proof. Um, but if you look here, there are lots and lots and lots of lakes. Interestingly enough, these lakes are almost all round and we're going to come back to that by the end of this groundwater stuff um, but all those lakes tell you that the water table level is actually very very high here so the groundwater table is very close to the surface in Florida if we compare that to Arizona um, we have very very little surface water in Arizona there's only a few rivers that run constantly like the Colorado like the Verde River mostly does, um, the Salt River does most of the time, and the San Pedro down south. There are only two natural lakes in all of Arizona. And those are sort of in the rim country. One of them is Stoneman Lake and the other one is Mormon Lake. And neither one of those is very big at all. All the other lakes in the state are because of dams on the river. So that tells you our water table is actually very deep and there's places in here in the valley right around Mesa Phoenix where the water table is like up to 600 feet deep. So if you dig a hole that means you hit water right? Well it depends on where you are. Not everywhere has groundwater because not every rock can contain that groundwater. So there's only certain rock and sediment that actually holds groundwater. So one of the things that you have to have underground is a layer that has porosity. Porosity is the percentage of the total volume of rock or sediment that consists of pore spaces. So one of the easiest places to see this is in the gaps between 
sediment like sand or gravel. Loose, this loose sediment actually works very, very nicely. And as you can see, this well sorted actually works pretty well. Poorly sorted has a lower porosity. There's less space there because all the little grains fill in the spaces between the big grains. Sometimes you can increase the porosity um, if you have openings in the rock. So like limestone it dissolves and that leaves gaps. Or metamorphic rocks and things and igneous rocks tend to fracture and that can increase the porosity and give you places to store water but for the most part their porosity is actually very very low now in a sedimentary rock you still have porosity but because those grains are cemented together during the lithification process there's a lot less porosity than in a sediment that has the same grain size as that particular sedimentary rock so if we look at some examples here um, something with very low porosity um, is like a shale or even a fractured granite. So that's only 10% open spaces versus if you look at just sediment, open sediment, really gravel has lots of holes, clay has lots of holes. But when you compact that together, and glue it together to make a shale, it actually takes your porosity down very, very low. Now just not just the porosity, but how easily the water flows from one spot to the next. <clears throat> so let's look at this. Here is a vesicular basalt. Lots of holes, good porosity. So let's imagine these are holes that are full of water. And these are holes we're going to use to uh, extract groundwater. So we put in a well and you start pumping that well and all that water that hole goes away except now you've got a big empty hole so to get more groundwater you build another well and you pump that one and then you run out of that and you put another well and you pump that and then you run out of that so you sort of get the idea right this is not working very well if however there was some way to break that rock to make some sort of channels that go in between those holes, the water can actually flow between those channels so that when you start pumping the water out of, out of the one, the water's gonna flow between the different holes. This is called permeability. Now permeability is the ability to transmit fluids. I'm going to show you some examples here of how permeable different material is. And one of these days my video is going to load. It's going to be awesome. All right. So if you look on the left, you can see water going down through the layers of clay, not moving very quickly. In the middle is silt, a little bit bigger. And on the right is sand, which is bigger than that. And you can see the bigger the grain size, the faster that the water is able to travel in between in between the grains and fill in. So you really want your groundwater system to be somewhere where the water travels quickly and that's that permeability. You want it to be able to travel very easily. So a rock or layer of sediment or rock that has high porosity and high permeability that you can drill for groundwater extraction is called an aquifer. Now, obviously, that sediment is your best bet. Gravel, sand, those are what you're looking for. But layers of rock work really well, too. So rocks like sandstone, like limestone, like dolostone, or even fractured granite. These can all hold water, and they can all move water, obviously, to varying degrees. Um, and we see this even. They make coasters out of some of these things. You may have had a sandstone coaster yourself. Um, I know this doesn't happen in Arizona very much, but I'm from, from Texas, and it's really humid there. So if you pour yourself a glass of cold water, you get a lot of sweat on the sides of your cup. And so you put your cup on a coaster, and that coaster sucks in all that water so it doesn't harm whatever surface you set your cup on, right? And so sandstone and even limestone, this is travertine coasters on the bottom, work really nicely. But not all rocks do this. There are layers of sediment or rock that have a very low permeability that we call an aquaclude or an aquatard. Now, both of these terms are not quite interchangeable, but they, they work. Now, I know it doesn't sound 
super uh, sensitive to, to use the term aquitard, but if you think about where the term comes from, aqua means water, and the word retard in music means to slow down. So an aquitard is slowing down water, and an aquaclude stops water completely. So some examples of rocks that ended up, end up being aquacludes or aquitards is something like granite or a lot of metamorphic rocks, your big, hardy, crystalline rocks that haven't been fractured. Or, on the left, we have clay stone, or even a layer of clay sediment. Um, that layer of clay underground actually works really, really nicely, and that's one of the most common ones. Now, as long as I brought up coasters earlier, I thought I'd show you some other examples of coasters that you can buy. I think most of these I found on Etsy. Um, so, slices of agate. Water does not soak into those. Um, on the right, you can see granite coasters. Water does not soak into that. In the middle, you have a uh, slate, which is a metamorphic rock, super fine grain. Water definitely ain't soaking into that. And oddly enough, I actually own slate coasters, so they don't work very well for what they're intended, but they look cool, um, which is why I point those out for you. So this aquaclude, I mentioned that clay layer actually works um, very nicely. Here's another experiment where water is going through loam, and that's just a type of soil. But you can see all the water soaks into that, that top layer, but stops when it gets to the clay. So this affects aquifers, what, uh, which we're talking about now. But what we're going to see is it also has a big effect on landslides. So it's a super common uh, reason landslides happen are these layers of clay that are underground that stop water from moving and allow the water to pool there. So an aquifer, here's some examples of aquifers, and we're not going to get too much into that, into the different types, but I wanted to at least show you what this looks like there. Um, now a really famous aquifer is the Ogallala Aquifer. It covers a good portion of our of Nebraska, parts of Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, a little bit of South Dakota. This is a really big aquifer and the water that's in it um, is water that's soaked into the ground like 60, 60 million years ago. This is very old, old groundwater. Now if you think about it though, what are they doing in Nebraska? They're farming major farming and um, areas um, Panhandle of Texas in particular there's a lot of growth of uh, crops up there but if you've ever been to the Panhandle of Texas it's very dry so it's an area that grows a lot of crops but doesn't get much rain which means they really rely on the aquifer for um, watering their crops so there's a big big um, pull on this aquifer actually just kind of the detriment of this area. Now we have aquifers here in Phoenix. Phoenix is part of, or Mesa, or any of the valley here, we're part of the basin and range. And so we have these mountain ranges that are crystalline bedrock that are made of metamorphics and crystalline igneous rocks that don't hold water at all. But the basins, those valleys in the middle have been filled up with sediment over time. So there's lots and lots of gravel here to be able to store that groundwater. And this uh, picture on the right actually shows you what the aquifer is particularly here in the valley and in around Phoenix. We have a couple of different aquifers plus um, a clay layer that's buried pretty deep that traps salty water way down at the bottom that we do not use. And you can see in the um, map of southern Arizona here on the left, the yellow is where you do have aquifers, and the gray are the mountain systems where we do not. And you can see all of our mountain systems sort of here in the, the Australia's and South Mountain and the McDowell's that act as a block to our water system. And if we look at those aquifers for the whole U.S., you can see um, that aquifer in the basins of the Basin and Range stretches from southern Arizona into California and all the way through Nevada. Um, but you can see some major ones and also places that don't really have that aquifer either. Um, so we're going to look a little bit closer at some of the problems that happen in these aquifer systems.